This is Bible Academy. Today we continue our study in the book of Revelation. We are in chapter 6, verse 9, with a side study in Matthew 24, which we'll have at least one or two more lessons on before we continue on in Revelation. So to get ready, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins. At the same time, we're allowing His Spirit to control us. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and the time and the privilege and everything you provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. In our last lesson, we started studying Matthew 24 to see if Jesus' opening words were his version of the first four seals in Revelation 6. At the same time, it is a good opportunity to study through this chapter of Matthew, or most of it, because it hits on some of the major topics we are going to see in Revelation. Jesus begins to answer two questions the, the, two questions the disciples ask regarding Christ coming back, his second coming, and the end of the age. They ask when it would happen, and what would be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age. Now, rather than read through 14 verses, I'm going to take a little bit different approach here and show you a uh, outline, um, sort of a translation outline, modified translation outline. It shortens a translation, but I want you to see the outline here to understand exactly what's going on. So in 24, 4a, Jesus speaks. He warns, number one warning, on deception. And that deception includes claims of people to be the Messiah and that there are many deceived. There's a second warning in 6a, hearings of wars and rumors of wars. You're going to hear about these. Now remember, he's talking to his disciples in the first century they're some 40 years away, or actually less than that, to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. But remember, their question has to do with what's going to be the sign and when. We're still working on the what. In 6b, he gives an exhortation. Do not be alarmed because these things must take place. Then he says something about the time period. This is not the end yet, and that's significant. We haven't started the end signs yet. The basis of the prediction, you're going to see nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. More prediction, famines and earthquakes in various places. These are all predictions. The time period is the beginning of the birth pains, not the end. Warning number three, another prediction. They will deliver you up to tribulation, and they will kill you, hated by all nations. Warning number four, prediction, many will fall away. Another prediction, betray one another and hate one another. That will be going on as well. Another prediction, many false prophets who deceive many. Notice how much material here is dedicated to don't be deceived. All this stuff's going to be happen, happening, and people are going to try to take advantage of it to try to deceive you and lead you astray. That's one of the biggest, most popular things happening for, well, about since it started going into television and Christian bookstores. Constant uh, flow of people writing books and teaching on this is it. Rapture's around the corner. It's going to happen anytime. Get ready. And if you turned on Christian television, I'd walk into somebody's home sometime and they would have Christian television on. I mean, they probably kept it on all day, help keep them company. Same time they'd hear this stuff. And they get into prophetic stuff that gets everybody's attention. People get excited about it. But 
these people keep saying things that are just wrong. Now, I understand, you got to remember the circumstances. Prophecy was just getting popular. It attracted audiences. People were sitting there in awe, hearing about the next thing that's going to happen. Uh, all signs of the times, you still hear it today. Biblical prophecy is being fulfilled every day. All right, well, that's a pretty general statement if you think about it. Yes, there are wars and rumors of wars, isn't there? But I don't think that's what these people are talking about. And there's famines and there's earthquakes. And that is biblical prophecy being fulfilled every day. But it's not a sign of the end. And that's where people get confused. It's not a sign of the end. So I think if you're in this ministry very long, you'll know that um, I would say something like, well, don't fall for this stuff because it will mislead you and it will keep you distracted. And pretty soon you'll just be studying prophetic things and studying them out of context to try to build a case for understanding about the end times. I see people hitting and missing on the Revelation series sometimes. And I think, well, why are they just studying this lesson? Why aren't they studying the lesson before? Because that is sometimes the key to the next lesson. Uh, they say, well, I just want to know his view on this particular verse. But if you don't look at the previous lessons and how I got to that view, you're going to misunderstand why I interpreted it the way I did. That happens a lot with me, and I and I know that, and that's, you know, I can't really stop it, but it's a little frustrating on my behalf because I want people to get the whole understanding of it, whether it be about uh, prophecy or some other viewpoint I have. I want them to see the context of the book that was written, who wrote it, why you come to those conclusions, why I come to those conclusions. At any rate, well, let's continue. Uh, we're down to uh, 12a. <clears throat> because of wickedness increases, the love of many will grow cold. That's a prediction. Is that going on today? Yes. Will it go on before and during the tribulation? Yes. Uh, a promise. We haven't seen a promise yet. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. We talked about that. 14a, another promise. It's also a prediction. The gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed in the entire world for a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. It's an important phrase. It's sort of transitioning over to this next set of the outline. And let me get this on the board for you. This is one somebody's out there probably anxious to hear. Well, so am I. I eat this stuff up to signs that point to the end hmm now here's one of the problems as people's expectations what do they expect to see here uh, some particular cosmic condition some particular person to show up on the scene we've talked about some of the things that will happen at the beginning of the tribulation but this is talking about the end, towards the end of the tribulation. And so you might ask this simple question. Well, in fact, when we get done with these uh, verses, you might ask yourself, well, where are the trumpet judgments? How do the uh, bold judgments fit in? Because Jesus doesn't answer those. He doesn't talk about those. He's answering Two questions, and that's what you got to keep in mind. He's not given an outline of prophecy or, or a brief survey of prophecy. He's answering two questions so his disciples, as well as us, will get the important answers. And remember what they are. What's the sign before the end and when? Right now, we're still working on the second question, actually. What's the signs? He hasn't got to the signs yet. He's got to preliminary things are going to happen, which has happened in history. I really want you to get this down and get a framework in your mind for this so you can continually discern because when when it really gets hot, if you just take that term kind of relative here, when it really gets interesting in history, and this happens in periods of history, and it'll certainly happen towards the uh, leading up to the tribulation period, Things are going to happen, and people are going to start saying things, and you're going to go listen to some of these people, probably, hopefully with a head full of discernment, but don't be deceived. 
I will tell you, they'll mislead you. And they'll work their way and get your money too, by the way. And, and uh, your life and your service. You got to be real careful. You serve the Lord. You give to those ministries where you grow. Uh, that's not only commanded, but that's expected of Christians to help Christians uh, in their ministries if you're being ministered and to and you can afford to help them. That's that simple. Now, afford is another relative term. What does that mean? Okay, well, now this is important. Now we're talking about signs that point to the end. Let me put that up there just to keep that as a reminder for a moment. Remember this, that the end is Christ's actual coming and the consummation of the kingdom. That's when it all starts to fall together. He'll start to establish his kingdom. This involves the day of the Lord. And when I say the day of the Lord, now we're talking about the day of the Lord, not the previews of it throughout the Old Testament and other many, many passages in the Old Testament, especially that came to judgment, occasionally blessing. Um, but understand, uh, when it comes to the day of the Lord, we're talking about several events. We'll see some of them uh, perhaps in our study today. Keep in mind, you just put, let's just put. think of it this way. There's a line down the middle, and on both sides, you have several related events. And that's all part of the day of the Lord. Now, again, Jesus in this Olivet Discourse is not giving a, to use a football analogy or even baseball or whatever, a play-by-play -play or major event after major event sequence of the tribulational period. Again, he's just answering these two questions. So he hits on things they need to hear, important things they need to hear. The first one they need to hear and if you studied God's plan of the ages, this may have surprised you. The first one that really talks about the end is in 2415. Now, we did say that the gospel would go out till the end. Uh, but here's the first real sign people need to act on. They need to be always given the gospel. But here's the first sign people need to act on. And keep in mind who this was given to. Now, this gets a little complicated because there are different fulfillments of the destruction of Jerusalem. But this is one of the things that happened at the middle of the tribulation. We've studied a lot on that, if you've been with me. So, again, he's answering the second question first, and he says, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? The first sign Jesus mentions to this Jewish audience who live in and around Jerusalem, perhaps unless they're coming in for some teaching, when he's on the Mount of Olives, and this is it, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Now, here's why I, asked, here's why I brought up this earlier. What happened to the other sealed judgments? Uh, what happened to the Antichrist being on the scene? or the temple being built. Well, it hasn't been destroyed yet, so you can't hear him. You wouldn't expect him to start talking about having it um, um, rebuilt if it hasn't been destroyed. So this is the first sign. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky. This is at least a double fulfillment. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, I'm going to attempt to draw a straight line here. Well, I went back to my tool. I didn't want to mess it up. It's just too hard sometime on this board. At any rate, let me uh, give you an idea of what's going on here. This is kind of an overview of the abomination of desolation as well as the destruction of the temple. Uh, Daniel talked about the abomination of desolation. Jesus is going to refer back to that. Okay. Now, Daniel's prediction talked about Antiochus Epiphanes, 167 B.C. He was the first type, significant type, 
of the Antichrist because it describes some things he does, like uh, defiles the temple, uh, deals very uh, uh, roughly with the Jews in those days. And, of course, the Maccabees led their way out of that. But that is the first talk of the abomination of desolation. Then we come to Jesus' day. Now we're talking about 33 AD. He refers to Daniel. We just read that. And he predicts, as other scriptures say, we're not into that just yet, but I'm going to tell you what he's going to talk about, the destruction of the temple. That comes in 70 AD. And then there's the future. The one in the distant future, that is the final discussion about what happens to the temple. And this is where you have the real Antichrist. Okay, okay. So even with this, the destruction in 70 AD, you had Titus, the Roman general, who was sort of a, a type of the Antichrist as well. So you have three events here talking about the temple with Antiochus Epiphanes, then the one during 70 AD, where it's really destroyed, as well as Jerusalem, and three, we have the abomination of desolation, but the temple's not destroyed. Do you get all that? <laughs> so you have the Antichrist type here, so we'll just say type Antichrist. You have another type here, and then the Antichrist here. The temple is, uh, here. in this case, it was defiled. Here it's destroyed. And here it's defiled. All right. So when I said there's an abomination of desolation, it, it depends how broad you want to do, go on this time of abomination of desolation. Because certainly Titus defiled it when he destroyed it, right? But he also destroyed it. So that's why I emphasize. I'm just going to put defile and destroyed. So this is where it gets a little confusing. That's why I say it's at least a double fulfillment. It depends on if you go back to Daniel. Right, because then you had Daniel back here predicting it. All right, the prediction, and then you had uh, one, and then two with Jesus talked about it, and both talked about Jesus and Daniel. Let's write down Jesus here. Talked about the final Antichrist. So we're going to take it nice and easy through this. Okay, now. This is Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth. Okay, I'm calling it A.E. the fourth. He's a type of the Antichrist. This was fulfilled. This was fulfilled. What's next is this one. So I'm going to say fulfilled, fulfilled. And this is what we're looking at now. So if you live during Jesus' day and you heard this, abomination, desolation, well, it's interesting because you would have to see him as Titus, but he's not really the Antichrist, is he? But you also see the temple destroyed. That kind of messes up the final picture because you've got to have a temple. All right, I know this is something you have to kind of let sink in. Uh, so think about this, uh, sort it out in your own mind. Um, also, uh, this is called the far fulfillment. All right, when Jesus spoke of this one here, it's the near fulfillment. Okay, uh, that is from the standpoint of this particular passage. Uh, this far fulfillment of the Antichrist is the one uh, Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians 2. The uh, 
discussion of the Antichrist in Revelation 13, that's still in the far fulfillment. Now, an interesting phrase here. Now, this is actually two verses here. Uh, I should have put 15 through 16. All right, so I want you to see this phrase here, let the reader understand. Now, why do you need to understand it? Don't you know already that you're not supposed to understand everything? Because this is so critical. And the word understand here, no eo. Let me just show that to you uh, here in a moment. No eo. It means to perceive with the mind, to grasp or comprehend. So we're talking about serious. You need to get this. This is big. Now it's debated whether Jesus is saying this or John inserts this, let the reader understand. I have a tendency to think it's Jesus, though there's no way to know for sure here. Most of your um, translations, well, I would say all of your translations that I know of, they indicate either by these dashes or they might put it in a parenthesis. I think the Net Bible put it in a parenthesis. The other translations I saw puts these dashes. So it's set off. It's like a break in the thought. So let me just read it. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. So this is something you need to know and understand. When you see that abomination of desolation, you need to get to the mountains. Now, <laughs> here's where it kind of blows people's mind because they never really think about this. This is to the Jews in Israel. Now, if you happen to be over in Israel at the time and you're visiting, yeah, you better flee to the mountains. But this isn't directed to the Christian church, except those who are Christian Jews uh, as part of the church over in uh, Judea and Jerusalem, that area, that's the region is Judea, Jerusalem's the city. So keep that in mind. It's not that you shouldn't flee, don't misunderstand, but this is going to be the launch of the anti-Christian movement, the really big one by the Antichrist himself. Now we'll get into that later. So keep in mind who the audience is, the time in which it was written. Uh, I'm not sure how much of this we'll even be aware of when it does happen, if you're still alive in a place like the United States or England or something else. Who knows? Remember, uh, if you remember the seals, we went through a bunch of destruction already. Uh, uh, in fact, we went through basically the first half of the tribulation. Who knows whether we'll be able to even see this stuff on television or radio or even shortwave. I don't know. I never hear anybody talk about this, but if you have these kind of disasters going on worldwide, uh, you're going to have a real problem, probably having electricity. And that presents all sorts of problems with people trying to stay warm and functional and so on. But of course, that's the unknown factor that need, people need to keep in mind. So what we see here is an urgency, a warning, an urgency for people to get out. In fact, they need to get out fast and now. So Jesus gives some illustrations. Whoever's on the housetop must not go down to get things out of his house. Don't You don't even have time to get your go bag, your go bag. All right, uh, just go. Now, in those days, people lived on their housetops. That was sort of their living room. And they'd have steps on the inside or outside of their house to go up and down it. If you're on the roof, don't go back down. Don't go back into the house. Get down and get out of there. Now, the illustration, whoever's in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. Now, this would be a worker in the field. It could be, you know, the Christian, the believer. Uh, don't even go back in and try to get your cloak. Just go. Now you say, yeah, but I might need something that I just to stay alive. I need to grab my peels. No, go, go. So the command is to leave your possessions or it could cost you your life. Now, there's a reason for this because the armies are closing in and you need to get out the path you have 
as the Lord will make it. And it's, it's got a window on it. So you've got to get through while there's an opportunity. Now, go back to our chart for a moment. Let's see if it comes down okay. All right. This command would apply to both of these prophecies, both the near here and the far. Because when they close in on Jerusalem during 70 AD, you need to get out of there. It describes it as the army surrounding Jerusalem in Luke 21, 20. Luke doesn't even mention the abomination of desolation being set up. But here the signal to flee to the mountains is when you see the city surrounded by armies. Now the city surrounded by armies, uh, we expect to see also during the Armageddon campaign. Luke's description fits more with the near fulfillment in 70 AD. So when the Romans are about to lay siege, you get out. You'll have a window of opportunity to get out. You get out. Uh, the conditions for some people is going to be difficult. Verse 19, it's a problem with pregnant women and if it's in the winter or on the Sabbath. But woe to those women who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. You know that's a real difficult thing for pregnant women to move. Uh, of course, it depends on how pregnant they are. And have babies, they have to carry a baby at the same time. Well, um, I think this indicates you got to get your baby no one really discusses about what the baby's in the house. Well, you better go back and get it. But generally, if you're nursing, you would have the baby near you. So we're not talking about exceptions here. The other thing, and this is kind of a difficult one to explain, moreover, pray that your flight will not be in the winter. Now, that's not hard to explain. That's not what I mean, but it's the Sabbath here. The winter time, as you know, if you've lived around mountains and streams, that's when the snow gets up there and starts to melt and the swollen streams and, and the, uh, over there, it's the Jordan River. Also, there's a scarcity of food out in the trees because it's winter time. You don't can't grab an apple, buy an apple orchard or uh, figs if they're not there, of course. Now, the thing about the Sabbath is when this was uh, preached by Jesus, they still are living under the law. All right. So you would uh, understand that this is still under the law. Now, the law will start to be phased out once the Holy Spirit comes in Acts 2. So we're kind of in a transition period here, but you want to make sure you cover the Sabbath just in case. Uh, people haven't transitioned out of that because the Sabbath would limit people's travels. Now, there were exceptions if it was an emergency. So some might ask, well, why would they do that if, if there were exceptions? Well, I guess it depends on uh, the word getting around and things like that. But that's not something you really need to fully understand. The point is that you don't want any hindrances to your getting out of there. So as soon as that abomination is set up, you want to be praying for a clear path. The point is that one does not want anything slowing him down getting out of the area. And there's an explanation verse. The word for hints us, gives us that hint. For then there will be a great tribulation such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will again. Now, people have taken this great tribulation as a more technical term. It's not the tribulation, the seven-year period, but the great tribulation, when things really start to get bad in the middle of the tribulation, so the three-and-a-half-year period, all right? Now, this entire period, after the abomination goes up, it's the Great Tribulation. Let's look at the word tribulation again. I've brought it up a few times. The word is, kind of fun to say, philipsis. Philipsis. It means affliction, distress. Um, it happens during both periods of destruction, whether it be the near one, 
the, f- the uh, near fulfillment or the far fulfillment. And this is an agreement with Daniel, what Daniel talked about. Listen to him in 12.1b. And there will be a, a time of distress which has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And this is talking about the final judgment. This is the far fulfillment. Verse 22. And if those days had not been cut short, no life would have been seized, excuse me, been saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Now, this is interesting because I have for a long time misunderstood this verse too. Because if it says it's been cut short, does that mean it's less than seven years? That's not what this is saying. It's saying that if this time had just kept going like it was, everyone would be wiped out. No one would have been physically delivered. That's what the saved means. But it is stopped. Why? But for the sake of the elect, those days would be cut short. Now, a couple of words here I want us to look at. First word I want us to look at is the word life. It's a word we don't see too often uh, in this context, but it is sarx. Now, sarx is the word for flesh. Uh, Flesh and blood, if you want to attach blood to it. That's a human being. No human would have been delivered if this period had not been stopped. So it's not saying that the seven-year tribulation is cut short, but the tribulation stops as a stopping point. So the expression for saying that if the tribulation had continued, then no one would survive. That's what it means. It's an expression for saying that if the tribulation had continued, then no one would survive. The rate of death was tremendous. And this tells you how widespread and deadly this period is. Believers have to be left to be called up with the trumpet in 2431, which we'll see later. Now we get into more warnings about false messiahs and prophets toward the end of the period as well. So again, during the tribulation, you're still going to be seeing deception and false prophets. That would be false teachers. Some will claim to be prophets and people claiming to be uh, the Christ. Uh, keep in mind that not everybody has communications that we have now in, in the future. It may even be less than what we have today. But people are going to say, there's the Messiah, here's the Messiah, and the false prophets will be all over the place. Uh, and Jesus gives more warning. Here's some more of the stuff that's going to go on. Verse 23, then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or he's over there, do not believe him. Now you might be thinking, now wait a minute, how can any Christian has any knowledge of the second coming fall for that? I don't know. I just think it's going to be religious people who think they know about Christ but never touch their Bible or go to a Bible study and they sit in church and hear the, you know, the the uh, encouraging messages without hearing really strong teaching in the word, and they're easily deceived. Verse 24, look at, us, look at this. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform, listen to this one, great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Folks, these, I understand, are going to be demonically powered individuals who will perform uh, incredible supernatural signs, uh, wonders to attract people. Now, why would they do to do that? Not only to attract people, but to convince them they're from God. Well, they're the ones to follow. And of course, they're going to be pointing people to the Antichrist, who will be claiming to be Christ. And that's another story in itself. But this is people taking advantage of suffering and terrible conditions that's been going on. People will be looking for saviors and some message of hope. Some people will be claiming they know where the Messiah is. Jesus warns, don't believe it. 
Don't believe it. Now, we've seen these charlatans throughout history, history of the church, and we see them towards the end when Christ is going to return. They will use their trickery and powers to attempt to mislead even believers. Um, there are still people around who will try to lead you astray. The false prophet, the big one, is going to be the second beast. He'll be supporting the uh, Antichrist himself, the first beast. And he will have a lot of success in doing this. Revelation 13, 13 and 14, 16, 13 through 14, and 19, 20. That's the false prophet. Jesus says, behold, I have told you ahead of time. So you already know this. This would speak to us as well. This stresses the point that they have been warned before it happens. Believers need to be ready for all types of deceptions. Now what's going to be interesting is if we still have communications like television today and we have leaders of our government coming out and saying, this is the Christ. We must follow him. And pretty soon, every time you turn a corner, it's kind of like the COVID thing. Uh, they expect you to wear a mask. They're going to expect you to follow. Like they expect you to get shots. They're going to look at you funny in the grocery store if you walk around without a mask or some other place. Because you don't have, pretty soon, they'll be putting marks on people. All right? And we're not getting into that. They didn't have that in this, this chapter. But this is telling us, Jesus is telling us that we need to be ready for all types of deceptions. He's telling us ahead of, ahead of time. Now, how much better can that get? You're being told ahead, don't do this. Don't fall for that. Some will claim to have insider knowledge of where the Messiah is. Verse 26, so if they say to you, behold, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. Don't go out to the wilderness. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms. Now, the inner rooms were, well, in houses. Doesn't mean it's a secret room necessarily, but it's inside houses. Oh, he's over in that guy's house. You know, like you're, uh, go back to World War II where people were hiding the Jews. That He's in there. People be claiming the Messiah is over there in that house. You know, like it's really special. That's a trick to hook people. Either if he's out in the open or in an inner room, don't fall for it. Verse 27, for just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Folks, if there's one verse here that you need to understand when it comes to the second coming, it's going to be very clear and very obvious. The image here is from one end of the sky to the other. His coming will be visible. Make no mistake about it. Get this in your head now because this is the way he's coming. It's not going to come secretly. He's not going to come a little at a time. He's not going to start the word getting out um, like John the Baptist did for him. No, he's going to come and it's going to be seen everywhere. It'll be sudden. And it'll be visible to all. There's nothing hidden or secret about it. So now Jesus is answering the question of what will be the sign of his coming. It will be a worldwide and visible event. Remember that. So is there a sign before that? Later it's illustrated by the days of Noah. And they were all unaware until the flood came. That'll be the general population's understanding. They won't know he's coming. They don't believe it until he shows up. Then we have this rather unusual verse that people struggle with. Verse 28, where the corpse, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Now there's, as usual on these difficult verses, there's a number of viewpoints. But a couple of the best views on this. Let me give them to you. This pictures the return of Christ. This follows the thought in the previous one of his visibility 
as the visible vultures indicate where the dead bodies lie, so Christ will be visible, indicating his arrival. The other view, which I adopted when I taught through Luke, has to do with the large number of bodies that will draw the vultures in the area. So this is a sign of judgment, which comes when he arrives in Armageddon. Now, when Jesus shows up, he's, this is one of those several events around the day of the Lord, one of them is going to be judgment. It's going to be going through the Armageddon campaign, and he'll be slaughtering people uh, by the millions, I would say, maybe even bigger than that because you have the major armies of the world gathered there. Verse 29, But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So these are some of the final uh, things that happen right before Jesus descends from heaven until into our sky. You're going to see the sun get darkened. The moon will not give us light. Stars will fall from the sky. Let's talk about this. Let's break it down. So the first line, don't miss that, but immediately after the tribulation, we're at the end of the seven years, basically. Cosmic signs of the Lord's return. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky. Let's look at a few other verses that predicted this in the Old Testament. These are pretty clear that these have to do with the day of the Lord, because they say so. Isaiah 13, 9. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light, the rising sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. That's Isaiah 13, 9 and 10. Joel 2, 31. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Some more from Amos and Zephaniah, Amos 5:20. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark without a ray of brightness? Zephaniah 1.15 That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Now, you may ask what I think is kind of an obvious question, though I don't know if people think about it. I don't always think about it. We just saw this coming like lightning, and now it's dark. How does that work? Well, to put this together, I think you have darkness shortly before he shows up. You can see how that works out in the sequence of events later on. But that's one of the significant signs. Everything goes dark. Everything goes dark. They say, yeah, but won't they have light bulbs and stuff? I don't know. I doubt it. The sixth seal coming up in our study anticipates and previews, don't miss that word, previews this greater day of the Lord with its own period of cosmic disturbances. So you have kind of a, a mini, that is M-I-N-I, -I, uh, picture of the day of the Lord. That's why I call it a preview. But it'll actually be a real thing in itself. But it'll picture what's coming that's going to be worse. Let me just read that. We haven't got there yet in our revelation, but it says, And I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair. The full moon became like blood. The last line we see here, And the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, some say the powers of the heavens are the demonic cosmic forces. Uh, sometimes in some context, context that's true, but that's not in this context. This really has to do with the cosmic forces, the natural forces that keep the heavenly bodies in line being shaken. And this signifies that God is causing something big to happen. 
in history. Haggai 2.6, sometimes it's used figurative, like in Haggai 2.21. Luke, go to the parallel on him. Let's look at a couple of his verses. Luke 21, 25, and 26. Read. And there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars, and on the earth nations will be in distress, anxious over the roaring of the sea and the surging waves. 26. People fainting from fear and from the expectation of what is coming on the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So there is some major catastrophic things happening for real. If you see this kind of reaction of people fainting from fear. Look at that last verse again. No, I'm actually going to put them both up there again. Because this is a pretty serious catastrophic period. One more time, and there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and on the earth nations will be in distress. They think they've had it. Anxious over the roaring of the sea. We're probably talking about huge, huge waves and the surging waves. People fainting from fear, from the expectation of what is coming on the world. Uh, often watching the weather here in uh, uh, where we live now, south of Houston, but not as far south as Galveston. We used to live a lot closer to Galveston, but they would show on the weather uh, the uh, Galveston Bay down there, what the waves were doing. Sometimes if there was a hurricane out in the water, you'd see big waves. Other time, it's pretty calm, just regular little waves. But these are big enough to just scare the wits out of people because they know what's coming on the world. Notice, and from expectation of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Something is really off. All right? So these major catastrophic things are happening for real if these kind of reactions are being seen among the people on the earth. It's a terrifying time. Now, as informed Christians, we know that Christ is about to appear. In fact, these are signs that are heralding, in a sense, they're announcing the coming of Christ. But is there one single sign visible in the sky right before Christ ascends to the sky? Verse 30. So verse 30 says, And then the sign of the Son of the Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. The word then, second word in the verse, tells us that this is something separate than what we've seen already. And that the sign uh, is not Christ's return itself. That's one of the views. People say, well, that's his return. His... I don't think that's the case. I think this word then tells us that there's something else going to come afterwards than what we've already seen. Now, let me give you a hint of what this means. Matthew mentions both sign and trumpet in this and the next verse. Signs frequently went with trumpet sounds in the ancient world, the battle standard or ensign being revealed or unfurled often went with the trumpet sound. It served as a signal. So, a banner or battle standard would be unfolded. Uh, Jesus, this may be at the time in which Jesus more or less decides to charge and go after the enemy armies surrounding Jerusalem. So there may be a battle standard unfurled and the trumpet sound. Um, there's sign insignia is also associated with the eschological 
gathering of the people of God. And we'll see that shortly. Um, look at verse 31, Isaiah 11, 12, 18, 3, 49, 22, Jeremiah 4, 21, 6, 1, 51, 27. Sometimes I'll read those too fast if you want to write them down or look them up. Notice the second thing that happens. So you have this sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Now, there's two reasons people will be mourning at this time. Some, as a result of the great judgments being poured out on them, and if they survived and Christ is arriving, they know that worse is coming, including judgment. Revelation 19, 11 through 21. This is those who not only rejected him, but in principle those who sent him to the cross both Jews and Gentiles. Let's go back and look at Revelation 1, 7 again. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will mourn on account of him. Even so. Amen. The second group, these are those who, well, let me just read the verses. And you'll understand better when I tell them who tell you who they are. Zechariah twelve nine. And in that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. This is the Armageddon campaign. The Lord returns, begins to destroy those armies, converging on the remaining survivors in Israel. And as he destroys the armies around Israel, particularly uh, we're getting to just Jerusalem. Many, if not most, of the Israelites will turn to Christ through faith. It's a remarkable verse, Zechariah 12, 10, the next verse in Zechariah. I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they will look to me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. The Spirit of grace here is the Holy Spirit. It falls upon the people of Israel. They are going to come under great conviction. Many begin pleading to God for forgiveness, and they will mourn in repentance. A large majority of Jews will turn in repentance during these moments and realize that Jesus truly is the Messiah and believe in him. This is what Paul, at least in part, referred to when he says all Israel be saved in Romans eleven twenty six. Now let's look at the last phrase here. It starts with and, okay, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. The Son of Man here, to put it in the Old Testament words, is the Lord, capital letters, L-O-R-D, Yahweh of the Old Testament. The clouds of the sky accompanying him will recall the Shekinah glory that led the Israelites in the desert. He's also coming with power and great glory. This is manifest in his arrival and is about to be seen in significant action. Now we'll look at the look into the arrival uh, much more detail later on in Revelation study. Uh, verse 31. And he will send forth his angels with a loud trumpet blast. They will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. This is an interesting verse. They will gather the elect, another word for believers, from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. That's the idea. From where they are gathered is said in different ways here for emphasis. So we get two expressions here to say they're coming from all over. From the four winds, the same as the expression, four corners of the earth. There also says from one end of the sky to the other. Now this expression, you got to keep in mind what we studied earlier back in verse 21 and uh, lesson 21. The expression is from the viewpoint of how the ancients viewed the earth and the sky at the time that there was a solid dome 
above the sky that held back the waters. So it is like saying, gather from within the dome, from one end of the sky to the other. God's heavenly servants, the angels, come down to gather believers from around the earth up into the sky. Matthew 13, 49. Let me read you some other verses from Matthew and one from 1 Thessalonians about this gathering. Matthew 13, 49 is our first verse. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous. 1627, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. See, I told you there's a number of things that go on in and around the coming of Christ. Now we're talking about some being rewarded. We're talking about uh, a separation from the wicked. 2531, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Here's Jesus taking up his throne during the beginning of the millennial kingdom. 1 Thessalonians 4.17, after that, we who are alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Another one, you don't see this one too often, Jude 14 speaks of Enoch. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. Some question as to whether this is the uh, believers, the saints, or angels, or both. I don't know if that's worth even debating. There's going to be a lot of people there and a lot of angels, those who are holy are actually going to get their resurrection bodies. Some are going to be transformed from earth itself. They won't be with him, but they'll be coming up right after uh, Jesus comes down. Well, this ends Christ's answer to the first question of the signs of his coming. Okay. Let me show you that question or that set of questions one more time and we'll close that's back in verse 3 and as he was sitting on the mount of olives the disciples came to him privately saying tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age so he answered the Second question first about the sign, and next time we will look at the first question, when will these things happen? Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this great opportunity we've had today to study your word. We've heard many details, exciting things to happen in the future. Help us be ready, prepared in every way, continue to give that gospel, Unto the end, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.